very talented and gracious organizers uh, of the conference and our hosts, and, and particularly Joseph and Helen and uh, Joel for all that hard work. Thank you guys so much. Uh, and also to the Center of Middle East Studies here at the University of Chicago and uh, the building we are currently in. Secondly, I would like to urge caution in the midst of my talk here, which is about the trajectory of the Assyrian predicament in the Middle East, and I will touch on Iraq and, and Turkey uh, in the 20th century. But I would like to urge caution in the usage of the term religious minority to refer, at least as the only identifier, um, to some, at least to some of the communities who we, we are referencing here today. Now, it's certainly evident that words have a tremendous amount of power and authority. And in this particular case, this term can, and indeed proceeds from a framework which itself is largely to blame for the current situation uh, of some of these communities. In the case of my particular of my particular case study, the Assyrians, it's evident that part of their endangerment, current endangerment, which is a term I like to use uh, for this community, is couched in a dual threat, which while targeting the people themselves throughout the 20th and into the 20th century, uh, physically through forms of especially gender violence, which has come up more frequently than as of recent issues, uh, gender violence such as rape, theft of women and children, outright executions and killings, uh, ethnic cleansing, etc., also targets their identity itself through ethnocidal or cultural ge genocidal acts from literal effacing of monuments uh, to their simple destruction predicated and justified through religious adage. Something to keep in mind as we listen to the papers here today and the discussion progresses. That said, this particular paper will be a reverse trajectory of the Assyrian predicament in the Middle East. Now, uh, to weave a little bit of the narrative, and I do want to, there's a little ca caveat here, mention that it's not, this is not, it should not be taken as a story or as a narrative of solely victimization, but rather as a narrative of a trajectory or trajectory of violence but in order to understand the current situation. So in the endless, endlessly prophetic words of the late Joshua B. Sign, who was my mentor and colleague and friend, <coughs> quote, the only thing we tend to learn from history is that we don't learn from history, end quote. In the midst of the current humanitarian crisis and equally devastating religious and cultural obliteration rampant in Iraq, Syria, and elsewhere around the world, little information of the historical continuum of the crisis has surfaced. Despite their integral part in the very fabric of the history and culture of the Middle East, few are aware of the various native and minority communities who have largely remained on the margins in political dialogue, media coverage, and academic discourse. And this continues today. What has been the place, what has been the place and treatment of ethno-cultural, religious, and linguistic minorities uh, of the Middle East in the past that has led to the current state of affairs of the present and angles a trajectory towards the future? That is my major question. It has been for quite some time in most of my research. What can and is being done to quell this devastation? Is there a place for pluralism in the current Middle East? Uh, and finally, what agency is left to these particular communities? Now, I'm not going to get into all of that today, but uh, hopefully we'll touch on some of it. Now, as mentioned, uh, I'll focus on the Assyrians as a case in point, as a litmus test, if you will, for threatened communities, illuminating patterns of hostility, dispossession, and displacement, to borrow uh, the title of Don Shetty's work. To set the stage for those who are unaware of the community in question, geographically, the Assyrians are typically a transnational population, uh, indigenous to northern Mesopotamia, so part of today's northern Iraq, so eastern Turkey, northwestern Iran, and northeastern Syria. They speak, uh, to their minds, a, a, a sense of modern Assyrian, sometimes referred to in its modern form as Mesopotamian Aramaic, uh, commonly as Neo-Aramaic or Neo-Syriac sometimes, with heavy Akkadian influences, as well as utilizing classical Syriac as a, an ecclesiastical tongue. Uh, both Akkadian and Aramaic, not so strangely, were official languages in the Neo-Syrian Empire, which flourished from around 934 BC to 609 BC. So we have that continuity of language. Today, many continue to affiliate with one of the following historical Christian religious communities and, and, uh, and others, but the following ones are the historical ones. And that would be the members, or some members of the uh, Assyrian Church of the East, sometimes pejoratively known as Nestorian, the uh, Chaldean Catholic Church, since 1552-53, an offshoot of the Assyrian Church of the East, Syrian Orthodox, uh, sometimes referred to as Jacobite, and the um, 
Assyrian, uh, excuse me, the Syriac Catholic Church. In the past two millennia, the Assyrians have more, been more widely known by these ecclesiastical denominations and designations, increasingly uh, in a sense of balkanization, both by internal factors and external factors. Their language and material culture constitutes certainly one of the older, if not one of the oldest, continuous traditions in various Middle Eastern environs and nation states. Uh, from ancient Arbelu and, and, or Erbeda uh, during the Christian period uh, to Erbil today, in the ecclesiastical province of Adiabene between the 5th and 15th centuries, all uh, part of the Church of the East, the ecclesiastical province. Uh, the presence and culture of the people of Upper Mesopotamia, it simply has endured. So Mosul, uh, as ancient uh, connection with Nineveh, Kerku, which in the Christian period is kept at Besloch, um, in ancient Arapha. Uh, Dohok is Beth Hadra, Matiate, which is current, uh, today's Midyat, uh, Zazabuha, which is even the village of Zaz in the Torahin region in, in Turkey. So there is this connection. Uh, Mount uh, uh, Izala, uh, which is Uzal, uh, it was referred to in the Bible. So there is this ancient connection for a lot of these uh, geographical regions as well. Uh, despite their history, Assyrians are both actively, directly, and, and what I can passively or indirectly unimagined from the Middle East, and Hebel has already discussed some of this, at least in terms of uh, genocide. But unimagined from the Middle East, its culture, its history, and even periods where they play arguably a polit pivotal political role. In true, in true Gramscian fashion, they are functionally the subaltern. So that term comes up quite frequently, when I think of the community. For the sake of the discussion, I, I ask just everyone to keep this in mind. So, in what ways do they matter to this particular history? Should they be lumped together in one geographical region? Should we talk about Assyrians solely in Iraq or in Turkey um, or a particular time period? Should they be compartmentalized? Uh, or rather, should major events be viewed as part of one continuity? Uh, can this be done without creating anachronisms, which is a major issue? Now, this normative framework, and, and I certainly contend that I have a normative framework, and I hope that others do that more often. Um, but I would contend that if we look at this, um, that this is a trajectory, and, and that would be my contention. It is a trajectory. Um, but we must look at the particular events and how they are connected over time to the larger history of the region. And this is where I would do the reverse, work in words, reverse fashion. On October 8, 2015, uh, IS released videos reportedly recorded on the eve of the feast day of Ida Etha, Executing three Christian Assyrians at point blank range. This were, these were uh, Dr. Abdel Messiah Ania of Tal Jazeera, Asher Muslim Awrahim of Tal Jazeera, and Masam Isa Mikhail of Tal Shamiran, uh, three villages along the Khabar River in, in Syria. As the, as the executed fell, three more in arms jumpsuits were obliged to take their place. Meanwhile, other threatened uh, groups um, were kidnapping, or groups were kidnapping. Um, people and holding them at ransom. All this was happening at roughly the same time. Uh, now, this event was more than seven or eight months in the making, according to a lot of people. As the veil of night lifted to give way to dawn on Monday, February 23rd, so just prior to that, not so long prior to that, a few months prior to that, um, the residents of more than 35 villages along the Kaaba River in, in, in northeastern Syria, where these villages are located, awoke to fighters combing the region, raising villages and plundering churches and homes while rounding up imprisoned civilians and destroying churches, including uh, those in Tel uh, and Tel So these villages and villagers had experienced a general terror and dismay of, of 3,000 people dis uh, displaced, excuse me, as well as uh, the kidnappings that were mentioned. And simultaneously across the border in Mosul, uh, a city that was recently emptied, uh, as uh, the mentioned, uh, recently emptied of many of its original inhabitants, spokespersons for uh, the group in, or the, the group that had attacked the region produced YouTube videos uh, of the desecration of hundreds of ancient artifacts and sites um, as leftovers from a period of uh, what's termed the age or period of ignorance followed by bulldozing of portions of ancient sites of Nimrud, uh, which, um, and Korsabad, or Dushar Rukin, Hatra, and, and Ashra, among other areas. This, along with the expulsion of the majority of that population of Mosul that had occurred not long before that, uh, was referenced in an article uh, by the UK-based spectator from February 27, 2015, entitled, quote, for modern-day Assyrians, their presence is under attack from 
uh, from IS as their past. And Ed West hearkened to a tweet by historian Tom Holland, who remarked, um, what is happening to the Assyrians currently is worthy of the Nazis. To go back to 1988, just uh, a couple decades uh, prior to that, the Anthal campaign, held as a Kurdish genocide by many and indeed as an offensive to quell and label Kurdish dissidents as what the Ba'ath had termed in many cases agents of Iran, agents of evil. Um, the occurrence in 1988 targeted, or we definitely see the, a large targeting of Kurdish villages and, and Kurdish intellectuals. Uh, alongside, uh, now this happens of course um, with the Assyrians involved as well. So the Assyrians are also distinctly targeted and lose approximately 50 cultural historical sites, including ancient churches and monasteries during the period of 87 to 88, as well as some 2,000 reported deaths in the 87-88 gas campaigns. So the Assyrians are, are linked there as well. Just previous uh, to that, or 10 years prior, in 77, 78, various villages, again in Iraq, were, uh, were targeted and destroyed by what, were term what was termed, excuse me, the border clearings in Iraq. Uh, the 1970s saw the expulsion of thousands of men, women, and children, which beyond its dispossession of ancestral ties and displacement, forcibly relocated many in collective towns, which were termed um, during forced urbanization. Around 70 towns, Iraqi towns and villages were destroyed, some by napalm uh, during the 70s, and many forcibly abandoned by their inhabitants, as were more than 76 religious structures uh, and other material items of cultural significance, and some of these all the way going back to uh, the third, fourth, fifth century. Um, over the 30 years just discussed, and of those villages which were not resettled by the, the Assyrian inhabitants themselves, uh, local Kurds, either being pro Badazani sympathizers or pro government sympathizers, uh, the tribal factions uh, differed, most uh, inherited the villages effectively shipped into Marx. So, in the cases of um, the Assyrian villages that were empty, they were relocated by predominantly Kurds from the, the neighboring areas. And it is estimated that the number of Assyrians in Iraq dwindled from over 1 million to 300 to 400,000 between 1961 and 1991. Likewise, across the border in Turkey, thousands of Assyrians fled due to continued cultural appropriation policies uh, from physical territory claims. Uh, to familial and village nomenclature changes, as well as major infighting between Turkish governmental forces and uh, uh, Kurdish dissidents, and sometimes general leftist parties. Despite this, the Assyrians were not without their own agency. So some of this has already been mentioned, but uh, for example, in Iraq alone, many joined the Communist Party and movement, as Ella mentioned, had had Ella by the <coughs> Um, 80s, the Assyrian Democratic Movement, as well as other groups in order to protect cultural sites, um, uh, in, in a sense, to protect culture, both animate and inanimate culture, physical protection of people, but the community itself um, and its culture. And though their participation was prominent and poignant in, in many ways, from the execution of ADM members, which is listed in, in human rights uh, documents from the Human Rights Watch, Human Rights of the Frontiers, um, the, so the execution of ADM members in the 80s to the battalions of Permismatic Chico fought alongside uh, the dissident elements in the north of the 60s, in, during the 1960s and 70s, to the so-called first martyr, in fact, uh, of the Kurdish cause, uh, Ethni of Shtemu, who was an Assyrian, whose monument still stands today in Hamidiyya in Iraq. Um, harking all the way back to the birth of communism and the influence of and a Syrian from Georgia, uh, Petros or Piotr Basim. So even the Communist Party had that strong linkage uh, to something uh, communally Assyrian. In Turkey, uh, they continued as part of the leftist movement in many ways for many decades, but were largely consumed eventually by more numerous uh, Kurdish, uh, Alevi, and general Turkish leftist uh, groups. Now, I'll also mention the 1933 massacre uh, in Iraq, in Semir. So I generally refer to it as a footnote in history, despite the fact that it has very prominent um, issues for the future. So as we move backwards in time, um, some 83 years ago, as the nascent Iraqi state and military carried out a massacre in northern Iraqi town of Semir in an effort to exterminate, in many ways, the forebearers of the same families who end up on the Khawar River, which is an interesting parallel. Um, the campaign was more or less, um, sorry about that, 
The campaign was more or less followed by pillaging, looting, and raising of, at my most recent count, over 120 villages in the surrounding region up to the city of Dubuk itself. Uh, according to one eyewitness account, I wanted to read this for you, the soldiers remained, that remained in the village uh, searched about to find any male person and shoot him down. Uh, about evening, they entered places, the fort and other houses, and gathered up women and children. Among the women and children, there were nearly about 100 men and grown-up boys who, being without arms to save themselves, had put on women's clothes. Those that were discovered by the soldiers and the police uh, were shifted aside as the women uh, and other persons that were in female dress were all examined. Um, and all the males were killed, but very much a gendercidal attack. I saw the police sergeant also dashing the priest's heads, uh, the, excuse me, the priest's two children of four and six years of age against the wall because they were clinging to their father and screaming after him as he was being taken away. Asha Shmael was taken outside where he was joined by another priest, Asha Sanos, whom the police had found in another house. They were both murdered just below the fort in a house known as the House of Tushaba. Their beards were cut off and their hair was dashed in their mouths. Uh, Colonel Stafford, who was a British uh, military officer, mentioned that the killing of all the men, uh, after killing all the men, the soldiers stripped the dead, taking their things of value, and went after the women. Again, we have gendered violence. Uh, Arabs and Kurds living in the region looted the village. The better looking women were mishandled, stripped, and let go. The wife of Yaqub, Melek Yaqub, the supposed leader of the Assyrians who had fled uh, to Syria, was repeatedly violated, stripped, and let go, and so were her two daughters. Uh, even the Ministry of the Interior, Hikmet Beg, had left Baghdad to see the destruction firsthand, and his reaction was also recorded by Stafford. So it's interesting we have an Iraqi uh, governmental so uh, source. Um, I was sitting in my office in the morning of the 15th when Hikmet Beg returned, this is according to Stafford. He came straight into my room in a state of collapse where he had just come from Samail, and even he, cynical as he was, had been overcome by the horrors which he had seen. On the previous day, I had received reports that there were large numbers of Assyrian women children in Samaria living in a state of starvation, but not a word had been said in these reports about the massacre which was the cause of this destitution. When I visited Samaria myself with Major Thompson on August 17th, few traces could be seen of what had occurred, but the sight of the women and children is one I shall never forget. And I spent more than three years in the trenches in France. Likening this death and devastation to perhaps the most horrid of Part of, of, of the Great War, which trench warfare arguably was the, one of the worst parts of World War I, uh, resplendent with its disease, its mustard gas, uh, would elicit in many ways how devastating the event was, at least in theory, as the initial military campaign of this newly independent state of Iraq. Roger Cumberland, an American missionary in Dubu, in a letter to Paul Benchu, the American minister of resident council in Iraq, from 1933, in May of 1933, um, to February of 1942. That was essentially how long he was there. He stated, this is Cumberland stating this, that Samael ushered in a variety of consequences. And the consequences were, one, that the reputation of the Assyrian warrior, so the sense of agency, at least military agency, had vanished. Something we'll return to briefly in the conclusion. Second, the tribes, the, the tribes in the region had seen with their own eyes that the British armed forces, whether land, sea, or air, took no part in the recent operations. Third, old animosities between Muslims and Christians have been aroused. Fourth, of local significance only, was that many of the Kurdish tribes that have quarreled over the spoils um, are so frustrated at this point that it would take something very small to incite them on, uh, to fighting each other, so intertribal warfare. Fifth, a seemingly absurd thing, according to him here, uh, but nevertheless significant, there was a shortage of el eligible Kurdish girls, and a good bride cost about $300. Um, and so whether consciously or unconsciously, the fear was that Kurds would start to go out and get brides by conquest, especially as most of the men had been uh, killed, had been eliminated in cement. Sixth, Samail massacre and the similar events have gone far to destroy the confidence of the Assyrians in and other minority groups, especially Christians in general, in the good faith of the government, or the lack thereof. And finally, seventh, there seems to not be any personal integrity in the government services uh, enab that enable them to form a stable administration who's according to the Assyrians and other minorities. To take a step back even further, the same communities experienced 15 years prior to Samail during World War I was ar arguably even more devastating. Indeed, 80 kilometers to the north of the city of Kamishli, which has made the news more frequently, on the Syrian-Turkish border, which was actually settled in the aftermath of the events of World War I that saw upwards of 
250,000, as Hamlet mentioned, of uh, Assyrians killed and thousands forcibly converted uh, alongside Armenians and Greeks. Um, during this particular period, many rural Assyrians living in, say, southeast Turkey have been living there for centuries. In many cases, with close proximity, they have been nations in similar tribal fashion and social formations in relative autonomy, free from most state influence. Now, the relative independence was actually did come to an end even earlier, so to go back even further, with the rise of the prominent, powerful uh, chieftain, Better Khan Beg of the Botan. Um, Better Khan's campaigns were initially directed against uh, Ottoman rule, but then shifted to local Assyrians in many cases. Yet once the Ottomans ceased their attacks on Better Khan in 42, he, as I said, he directed his attention towards the Assyrian community, especially in the Haikari. Um, and in one campaign, massacred approximately 10,000 people. Uh, the Ottomans, of course, capitalized on the ambitiousness of Better Khan, and once the independent Assyrian tribes had been subdued, the Ottomans planned to continue this sort of uh, exclusion or, or elimination. Um, by the turn of the century, most Assyrians in the region of, of Urmia and Haikari, Urmia or Rezae in, in uh, today's Iran, and Haikari in southeastern Turkey, not counting the, re the, the Tigris region, amounted to more than 450 villages and between 18,000 and 20,000 families, totaling between 126 to 140,000 in 1902 1903. Now, this is just the Urmia and Haikari region. Um, Hannibal Travis, Professor Hannibal Travis, has mentioned and estimated that using the Armenian patriarchal assumption of 25% population growth over 20 years, this was but part of a much larger population of perhaps six to 800,000 that would fluctuate dramatically. The data suggests that at the onset of the war, World War I, there were an estimated 80,000 Assyrians in the Tigris Valley alone from Mosul to the Bhutan region of, uh, of Turkey. Um, by 1915, there were more than 100 Assyrian villages destroyed, and about 12,000 refugees had fled to the Caucasus, and more than 27,000 men, women, and children were killed in the Urmia region alone. In the village of Ada, there was the tale of approximately 300 Assyrians locked inside of a church and burned alive. This general relentless combat, killing, death, forced expulsion, and loss of home and hearth exemplified the period for most Assyrians and other minority groups. Uh, the Assyrians of Urmia and Iran, again, uh, refer to the period as generally as Raka Raka, which translates sort of as the flight or escape, as a mass exodus of about 30,000 men, women, and children from among, uh, among themselves and their Haikari brethren, and the traversing of more than 600 kilometers to the Bakuba refugee camp, 30 miles northeast of Baghdad. And records count uh, approximately a third of the people dying along the way, many dying of exposure, others murdered by bandits on the road. So again, time to uh, flight from, from home all the way back, to, all, all the way to today. Um, those, there are stories of those with children being slaughtered, wounds cut, uh, younger women carried off as brides and raped, uh, many left for dead, and many elderly killed and burned in order to extract gold, which uh, some believe they had swallowed or had been hidden in their, um, in their teeth. Now, after the war, there was a written manifesto of the desires of some members of the Assyrian community, and it was formulated in a pamphlet entitled The Claims of the Assyrians as presented at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, which define the Assyrian people uh, as including, as I mentioned earlier, but this is interesting, Nestorians, Chaldeans, Jacobites, a Maronite element, Persian Assyrians, Assyrians in Russia, a Muslim Assyrian group that included the Shik, the, what they termed the Shekheks, which I think is the, the Shikheks, um, and of course Yazidis, interestingly enough. So these were all mentioned by the group in 1919. So pre-extensive balkanization more recently. The delegation to the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 provided the following sort of general figures, which I think are important because we're going to argue that communities, especially minorities, have a sense of power or agency, then we should also look at their material. So they claim that there were approximately 1 point or 1,015,000 uh, uh, Assyrians total and the local Middle Eastern community or population totaled around 563,000 uh, souls. Thus, these two events, to mention Raphael Lemkin and, and Hannibal's um, connection, the two events, World War I and Samaev, which marked, were marked as crucial moments in the memoirs of a young Polish Jewish lawyer, Raphael Lemkin, when he formulated the definition of genocide, are scarcely mentioned today, at least in the sense of the Assyrians. It would seem that these happenings constitute a historical con continuum to an extent, at least of, of this minority uh, in the Middle East. The course, unfortunately for the Assyrians, as we've seen, did not really diverge much 
Uh, and more than 200 Assyrian cultural sites, including ancient churches and monasteries, um, have been destroyed in the past 30 to 40 years from Iraq, Turkey, and elsewhere. I mean, ultimately, part of my, my idea was to ultimately, by highlighting this history of the Assyrians as a native transnational community, one is better able to sort of create a model that can be used for an analysis of minorities across the region, sort of the treatment of minorities, where violence to marginalized communities is or can be alleviated by their inclusion in mainstream history, or at least the discussion of it. The creation is accomplished, hopefully, by demonstrating the importance of minorities to the general, generally accepted quote-unquote major events, right? If you can argue that they are important to major events, like World War I, as the, uh, in, in Semel, the, the, the turn of the um, uh, Iraqi military being propelled to the uh, mainstream, in the 60s, being involved in the Kurdish uprising, the first martyr being in Assyria. I mean, all of those things would make you think, perhaps, the Assyrians um, at least deserve a little more of the discussion in general. Um, so this, uh, this creation is accomplished by demonstrating this importance, uh, which in turn was hopefully or can be achieved through the application and substantiated by an inclus inclusive paradigm where all experiences are vital and exist in symbiosis with each other. So not always detaching the Assyrians as an Iraqi group or as a Syrian group, or, but, but actually talking about them as a sort of holistic, um, interconnected uh, group. And in many ways sort of boundless, as many groups are, sort of history as a big, big page, sort of boundless and unknowable in its entirety. These are not groups that are monolithic rubrics by any stretch of the imagination. But to use that approach to understand them. So this essential interdependence thereby safeguards the experience of these people on the margins, the Assyrians in particular, uh, from being subsumed, sort of this, what I term, subordinating narrativization by the mainstream through policies of acculturation tied to the destruction of place, ways of life, um, of the people, which are really the building blocks of identity and community. So various Middle Eastern governments, like a multitude of others, sometimes circumvented the scrutiny of physical destruction or the targeting of individuals by enacting policies of acculturation intended to affect social or spiritual life or identity of a community. Um, the Iraqi government's engagement in village clearings uh, has Turkish ones, uh, Turkish engagement as well, including church destruction, monastery schools, agricultural fields, livestock seizure, attacking means of stable livelihood, and expelling uh, and resettling populations into urban centers or elsewhere um, was a forfeiture of a particular way of life. Now, just as a conclusion, is there a place for these people in the newly democratic states? Well, this is the preamble, this is the brief clip of the preamble, preamble of the Iraqi constitution. The Iraqi, the Iraqi state mentions Quote, in, the, the Constitution was, quote, inspired by the tragedies of Iraq's martyrs, Shia, Sunni, Arabs, Kurds, and Turkmen, and from all the other components of the people, and recollecting the darkness and the, ravage of the, the ravaging of the holy cities in the south, um, and the uprisings and the flames of grief of the mass graves, the marshes, from the massacres in Halabja, Barazan, and I'm paraphrasing here, and Fal and the, the treatment of the baby Kurds, and inspired by the ordeals of the Turkmen, uh, in Bashir, end quote. An absence of Samail massacres of 1933 that influenced Raphael Lumpkin as a watershed moment for the nascent Iraqi state, and especially its military. No mention of Assyrians at all for that matter. No mention of 200 plus churches, monuments, schools, monasteries, villages, uh, mon monasteries pillaged and destroyed from 61 to 88 in, just in Iraq alone. Um, and in Turkey, the continued discussion of Assyrians as Semitic Turks um, and simply as Suryani as an ecclesiastical bond continues to today. Now, finally, to quote Lebanese archaeologist Joanna Bajali in reference to uh, the current religious zealotry, to go back to the present, uh, that the community is facing, quote, cultural, the computers, community is currently facing cultural genocide since the local group that is targeting them rejects and destroys, rejects others and destroys by digging up graves to say that no one comes before nor after it. And all for financial gain while the world loses a cultural a legacy. The biggest losers are the Assyrians as a people and Iraq as a country. The world has lost an important part of human history. It's a loss for the Assyrians and the end of them in a way because they tie their roots to the civilization." End quote. I recall here the, the comment by Robert Cumberland, the American missionary in Dubuque, remarking on the consequences of Shabin by Samir. The understanding of this is crucial to the future of the Assyrian community in the Middle East. Currently, they are caught between religious zealotry on the one hand 
and verging nationalism, ethnocentrism, especially within the Kurdish region on the other. Partly because they have been easy targets of militarized groups, both state and non-state actors. Thus, in the last year, a, a contingent, both trans-denominational and to some extent transnational, uh, has created a wholly, uh, wholly sort of unified community and wholly community-funded security force or forces, including what's termed the NPU, the Nineveh Protection Units uh, in Iraq, and the Sutoro and the GF, uh, GPF, the Rosetta Protection Forces in the Syrian Jazeera, and this is all locally uh, funded and also community funded. Uh, and more recently, actually, Iraqi, at least the, the NPU, Iraqi government funded, but started sort of as a brainchild of the community. Um, despite many attempts by local groups to assimilate them or subsume them into the Peshmerga or the YPG um, or other sort of uh, uh, groups in the region, they have remained distinct. Now, these above all the mentioned groups have, have stayed in, independent in many ways and stayed outside of um, or retain their sense of agency, I should say. Um, finally, many Assyrians today have expressed their concern that the rebirth, that the rebirth of the, to quote Cumberland again, Assyrian warrior, may be the only bulwark left against displacement. And I use this as a quote, but this is, a, um, this is from many of, of my sources that I have interviewed in, in a lot of the world history I have done in ethnographic work. That the Assyrian warrior may be the only bulwark, or a warrior may be the only bulwark left against displacement and dispossession. And the current crisis has really only further acted as a reminder of the very real existential threat that they have and continue to face as an ethno-religious, cultural, linguistic, and native minority beyond state narratives and majority perspectives in the Middle East. And concurrently, the necessity of an emic, very local um, plan to shift the trajectory of its history towards the 21st century. Thank you. Is it a reality of, you know, 